firstly, thanks for, for joining in and uh, welcome to the AgVic uh, webinar series. This, today's webinar is the third in the irrigation series, understanding and managing water price variability on farm. My name's Rob O'Connor. I work with AgVic based at Chuka in the, in the irrigation team. Just need to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to um, registered participants uh, and that you are, are muted at the moment. Um, if you have any technical issues, please contact John Paulette. John works with the irrigation team with AgVic based at Tatura. Uh, John's details are on the screen there. Um, if you use Zoom chat to contact John with technical difficulties, please um, select host um, to, to, uh, to contact John. If you have a, a question through the talk, please um, type it in using the chat function and select co-host. So uh, the co-host is myself and I'll forward the, uh, the question on to Daryl. Uh, Depending on how we're going for time, um, we, we are likely to have a question break through the talk and there will also be further questions at the end of the talk. Uh, questions related to the webinar topic will be prioritised up the list. Um, and I'll just mention now, if you could uh, fill in the feedback survey, which will come up on the screen at the end of the uh, presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. We use that feedback with our funders to, uh, to fund further events like, like this one. And we do aim to finish at, uh, at two o'clock. Um, you, you might be able to, able to flick over the slides. Daryl, I think I think you've got control of that. Um, thanks to our, our supporters, so the Northern Victorian CMAs, God Murray Water, Regional Development Victoria, Plan to Farm, RMCG and AgVic. Uh, our, our next webinar, which will be on in late March, will be about the Goulburn Tamari trade review. There's been a lot happening just recently in that space and similarly with the Murray River delivery risk topic. Um, and so there will be uh, further webinars on irrigation trade after that March webinar um, and we'll move into a, after that we'll move into a focus on irrigation technology and irrigation management. Our speaker today is Daryl Poole. Daryl works as a, a farm consultant and he's also associate an associate with RMCG. Daryl has been in the water industry for over 20 years and has worked closely with irrigators over that time, helping them to develop water risk management strategies. So Daryl's pretty well qualified to talk on today's topic and I'll hand over to Daryl. So uh, yes, thanks Rob and um, please excuse if I <laughs> call Rob Bobby Rock because we go back a, a way. It pretty was 25 years when we first worked together Rob in the irrigation region of Northern Victoria. And look, thank you very much for, um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about water because I talk about water a fair bit. I reckon uh, there's not been many farm visits in those 25 years where water hasn't been part of the conversation because I predominantly work in the GMID and um, you know water is our foundation. So um, thanks for the opportunity. Just yeah, a little bit about me and RMCG. We're a multidisciplined uh, team. We do environmental and agricultural consulting. Um, they've done a lot of work in the water in the water area, uh, looking at um, you know implications of the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Worked with different industries like Dairy Australia and and the water authorities themselves. Um, so we've been entwined with water for a long time. Um, and uh, but what we try to do is try to bring the 
um, the complexity of it all into some into uh, something we can work with, something we can work with farmers with as they make their and consider their water management decisions. So uh, there's a fair bit to get through. So I will be going at a reasonable pace. And as Rob said, we'll we'll have a a, a, a pause or two for some questions. But towards the end of the of the pro, of the session. Um, Will we will we sort of uh, available that to to to, fend, uh, to to answer further questions as well? But what are we going to cover? Um, I think it's really important that we get a bit of a, a better sense of where the water position is is at. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the short term and long term drivers of that water market because I see water understanding actually leads to much more informed decision making, and that is one way to deal with the variability that we're dealing with. Having knowledge is really really important. We'll talk about how season supply influences the prices um, and, and what can be some of our on-farm strategies. What I'm not here to talk about today, I'm not talking about water policy, what should have happen, what shouldn't happen. Um, I'm more about dealing with, well, what, more about what we're dealing with, what we've got. So there is absolutely no doubt, in a fairly relatively short period of time, uh, the irrigation industry has gone undergone a lot of change. There's a lot of things been going on, um, all all at the same time, and uh, it can be hard to to keep abreast of all that change. Um, and so, what I'm going to try and do today is try and take some of that noise out of it um, and make it a little bit um, more. Uh, I guess uh, usable and uh, user friendly in terms of, okay, well, this is what it means. This is what I might do. A colleague of mine though, um, you know, has been quoted by saying, and, and I'm not sure if it's actually his quote or, or not, but uh, it's water, it ain't rocket science. It can be, a, it's a lot more complicated than that. And there is parts of it that seems absolutely uh, complex. But um, when it comes to some of the some of the key things like price and supply, we actually see it to be fairly straightforward, um, believe it or not. So um, where we come from, the last 25 years, there's been a lot of change. Hopefully we can see the curse that, you know, back in the 90s, late 90s, that was, in a, that was after a period of quite a historic wet period. And we had growth on growth, a lot of water available, and price pretty pretty reasonable. We'd love to see these prices. Um, and we saw, we did things differently. We did things differently because water was plentiful and it was cheap. And we moved into the early 2000s. You know, that, that five year period was reasonably normal. We had um, after a long wet, but we still had a mix of wet and dry years during that period of time. A little bit less water, a little bit more price. And we had a, a real challenge five years, the millennium drought period, um, the most extreme drought series we've experienced, record low inflows, um, and, and we, we saw a low volume of water. This is the average available water over those five years, and this is the average allocation price over those five years. So certainly we saw significant peaks in that period at the peak of the drought, for sure, the spot price, but the average over, over that period um, around about the $400 mark but still low supply, firm price. Then we went into the two, 210 and 215, we actually had um, quite a wet period. We had actually four years in a row where uh, we, we had 100% allocation on, on every entitlement type just about in the whole of the Southern Connected Basin. So a lot of water, but we were starting to see some of the government water recovery through the plan. So uh, again, a reasonable amount of water um, and we see a softening in the price. And then this last five years, and I'll talk a bit about this more later, but um, we've had a, a real mix in this last five years. We've had a dry period, a, a, a bit of wet, um, some, you know, some really tough, you know, drought conditions, but it's also been post the, where most of that government water recovery has happened. That's behind us. So that's effectively though, having some influences of where we are. Again, a low amount of, a lowish amount of water available during that time. And, and, and price um, somewhat connected to that. When we, when we, so this talk, I should have said it right at the start, really is about the surface water in the Southern Connected Basin. That's what I'm talking about. Um, yes, there's groundwater and there's other water sources around, but 
this was primarily talking about the surface water in the southern connected basin. And that's how we have to think. We have to think about the southern connected basin because what happens in your backyard is important, but what happens in, in the other backyards within the basin is also important. Yes, there is some trade restrictions that will influence market behaviour to a degree, but fundamentally the price, the price driver is water availability in that, that full connected uh, system. And some of the information we present, uh, I'll present here will, will hopefully shed light on that. <clears throat> we look at water a little differently to, to most. Um, you know, water, water, water packages, oils aren't oils. Uh, some of you go back to the old Castrol ads. Um, the, the, the different parcels of water out there, they are different. We, and we look at it in terms of what we call, what we call in the super secure water. That's that first 50% of allocation against the high reliability water uh, entitlements out there. That happens just about every time. Even in the Manilian drought, that average over that period of time was about 50% of the high. Um, and that represents about 1500 gigs of water. Then we look at the next level of security, the secure water. And that's the between the 50 and 100% of the high reliability. Adds another about 150 gigalitres into, the, into that available pool. And then thirdly, the more variable water. This is the, the water against the general security entitlements in New South Wales. And that is, as, it, as we describe it, quite variable, not to 100%. And, and, it, and it goes like uh, up and down. But on average, you know, at a 65% allocation, um, you know, around about 1800 gigs is another, in theory, is available through, through that entitlement. There is low reliability water shares in, um, in, in, on Victorian's uh, system. And although they um, can potentially provide an allocation ever since their inception, I think there's only been a very small allocation against Murray low reliability since their inception. So effectively not really a, a, a uh, a yielding entitlement, more of an entitlement used for carryover. So who uses what? Who needs the premium oil? Uh, we look at the super secure. That's obviously uh, for those, you know, the permanent horticulture. Um, they, don't have, uh, they don't have access to too much other alternatives. It's a bit hard to feed a tree hay uh, like you could a dairy cow. So there's, there's, they've, got a, they've got no choice but the water. So their, their potential growth is somewhat limited to, to the, what water is available in those, um, in those drought periods, that 1500 gigalitre mark. Then the next level of water, who's, who's in the marketplace for that? And, and yes, there is some direct, um, you know, the, the value tree, I guess, so hort, permanent horticulture at the top of the trees, excuse the pun. And then, then the next sort of high value industries, dairy, cotton, uh, specialised crops maize, um, where they're more consistent in their water use, but still could, can opt out of irrigating if conditions are, you know, are very dry. And then the more, the variable water, that variable water component, the full component being at 2200 gigs, it's predominantly the more opportunistic users, the rice, um, maybe pastures for rice growth, finishing off winter cereals, those sort of things. These industries have to cope with an interruptible allocation. Um, and they need to have some lower overheads to manage that, um, that interruption. So what you do and how you go about it is which one are you? And I know we've got a reasonably diverse group here, um, Rob, um, and I'm sure we've got um, elements of everyone in, in, that, in, that, um, in the cohort here. Um, but what you do is does will depend, or what you do will depend on, on, on what you're doing with the water and, and and attributes about yourself as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of where you're sitting in terms of your, your balance sheet, what's your attitude to risk, those sort of things, which will all influence what end, you know, individuals end up doing to manage their water positions on farm. So where we see it, we see a dynamic equilibrium being reached. Um, we're not ones to say, well, it, all the water will flow to the, the highest end user because we say, we're saying that there's a limitation on what they can use because they're limited by the drought and that's those higher value permanent horticulture. And we see them, you know, work, working, operating around about the, um, it's all over the years have increased over a period of time, the, excluding almonds, mind you, using a you know, range about eight to 900 gigs. 
almonds pretty much zero in the, in the 90s, but the significant user and growth factor there and um, looking to be, you know, around the five to 600 gigs. Cotton has come into the Southern Connected Basin and replaced some of the rice in the Bidji, you know, using a range 450 to 700. Dairy, around about 800 to 900. They used a lot more than that, um, you know, earlier on, but, but using about half of what they used to access. But mind you, the, the production isn't half. So there's, there's an element of adjusting and changing to what they do um, and getting more from the water that they do use. Irrigated cropping, range to 200 to 600. Rice, rice is, will vary from year to year. Um, and linked to those that when there's um, those higher volume years when prices are suitable to, to, be, to be producing rice and we do we will have a more variable supply. Mixed grazing certainly have changed a lot in, in um, you know from the 80s to now and you know a, a smaller component. Then the other factor that we have in place is carryover. Uh, New South Wales have had access to carryover for longer than, New, than um, Victoria, uh, but you know it's it's pretty much now a, a, you know one of the one of the tools that we have. Sometimes we we add our carryover to our um, portfolios, and sometimes we mine it, and that's the whole purpose. It's bringing uh, cheap water into dearer years, and it's, it's just part of the risk management. But typically, seeing around the three to five and a half thousand gigs. Um, and averaging around the, you know, around about the four and a half, but droughts can be as low as, you know, 2000. That, that's also including groundwater when I make those, uh, those comments. So we see, so even though there will be some very variability in, in the water use from year to year, but we see that with, with that dynamic e equilibrium, that there is water available for most industries. How much, you know, not like where we were in the past, but options for, for different industries, depending on where they sit in, in, in that value chain. So Robbie, I just might just pause a sec there and see if there's, um, you know, if there's any questions on, on what we've, um, what I've covered so far. I haven't got any questions on my chat line. I'm not sure if you or John have got any questions there. Want me to ask myself a question? I'll uh, <laughs> um, I'll I'll just ask one quick quick question, Daryl. On that, the equilibrium of the water use between the different industries, do you see that changing much in the future, particularly in regard to those um, the horticulture and almond categories that you had up the top of the table? Yeah, well, we, we, we think they're getting close to where they're going to be, um, Robbie, with the amount of water that they need now to support what's what's growing now is getting close to that um, that that super secure water amount. And so, yeah, there'll be ebbs and, and, and throws and ups and downs in there. But we, we're thinking that's where that's where we're sort of landing in those sort of, in those sort of areas. And the reasons are why is what what we've what I've covered there. You know, limit, limited by the drought, they're limited to the water available in the drought because they don't have much other choices. And yes, there there'll be strategies to move around that, strategies around carryover and the like. But they really will be sort of just more at the margins, and um, and that's that's sort of where we see it. Okay, well, I'll keep moving on, Rob. So I sort of alluded to this earlier, but um, you know, the last five years, we've just about experienced a lot. Just, but acknowledging though, no, uh, we haven't had that absolutely severe drought as we had in the millennium drought. And also we haven't had the absolutely super wet, but pretty much we've, we've had the lot. Um, we've had the spread of the climate conditions. It's, it's been during a period where most of the water recovery has occurred. Um, and as I said just before, the majority of the horticulture growth growth getting close to where they're going to sit. So, um, so we believe that la the last five years is a pretty good indicator of what we might be in for going forward. And, and, and that, that is what we have to um, work towards or, or, or to, to get, get it uh, ingrained in, in our thinking for our planning. So when I look at, when we look at those years, we've had a dry, we've had a wet, we've had an average, we've had a very dry and a drought. 
or what we call a drought. And those are all aligned to the allocations. And if we look at the allocation, especially on the general security water in the Murray and, and the, that's a shorthand for the Murray and Bidgee, the Bidgee uh, we've got um, where our high reliability for, as, for a period, except for the, the 1920 year being um, at 100%. But the, the allocations against these portfolios or these entitlements have been up and down. That drives the up and down nature of the water available and that drives the up and down nature of the prices that we've been experiencing during those times. You know, if we just look in our own backyard and 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, we see this variability in the water position, well, what's going on there? Well, what's going on there, it means that we are part of that connected base and there, there is influences across that whole water base that, is, that drives um, where we sit with price. Oops, sorry, I'll just uh, And yes, there's a couple of um, extremes that could happen again in the future. Um, the repeat of the millennium, what would it be where we have, you know, only that, you know, getting to that super secure water zone. Um, not much water available and we will see very strong prices and that's not telling anyone here listening anything I would suggest. Um, but we can have those really wet periods too, where there's 100 percent across all our entitlements plus you know, access to supplementary water. They can happen and potentially can happen again and we will see those um, potentially these prices down the, you know, into the future. So what we've done at RM is, is, is look to plot some of this history to give a sense of where things are at. And, and we feel that this price graph has actually been holding pretty true for the last 25 years. I'll just explain it a little bit. What we've got here is the allocation, weighted average allocation prices on the left hand side. And we've got the total water available in the consumptive pool. So it excludes environmental water and it excludes carryover. Just a point of clarification though on the on the on the water on the um, on the prices here. We've used the average weighted al average um, allocation price from the Murray Irrigation Limited um, Exchange. And the reason why we use that is because it's quite a clean uh, data set. Um, there's real transactions, there real money changes hands, and that um, uh, it does good give a, in our view a, a, a good representative of the middle line of, of the water entitlements um, in the basin. Now that's not to say that there any other sources aren't um, legitimate, they are, it's just that it's, um, you do have to do a little bit of cleaning on that, some of that data sets in terms of, you know, zero, zero trades, zero dollar trades and, and trades that can see, you know, seem ridiculously high. So we just, we just use that and that's been, that's, that's uh, tended to, to give a pretty good indication. So what we've got here is we've got this all the years plotted, you know, um, 2004, a bit over 5,000 gigs and where was the price sitting? A bit over 50 bucks. And we've got this, our, our price curve, obviously when we get low, we get, we get that, that heat in the market and that, that uh, position. And I guess the other aspect of this graph is that these sort of water volumes out here, well, they're past. They're done and dusted now because we will never get those allocations again because that's part of where you know the um, the Murray Darling Basin, that part of the consumptive pool that now no no longer is available to irrigators. So this is our zones we we're, we're seeing in here, and we're seeing you know in in you know an average year where we'll what we call about 100% high and 50% general security hitting about the $200 mark. Dry years about the $400 mark. Um, the really extreme years, you know, repeat of the million droughts, we're going to get that pressure that's um, fairly straightforward. Um, and we have seen that this, this graph, what, 220, um, where, where we, we are not far off where, we, where the line is suggesting it would be. So we, our view is that this graph, the shape of this graph hasn't changed too much over that 25 years, but we know there's been a hell of a lot of change in that time. If we look at 2005, 2017, we can think about all the changes that have gone on during that period. Um, but we see that the, 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 the volume available and the price that we're getting is pretty closely related. So we see it as not so much a, you know, that the, the, the game is supply driven price um, and very little demand driven price. There may be some arguments around that, but that's where we see it. That's where, where where um, this data is suggesting that's that's the that's the game that's the main player in the game. 
and just yet yeah, reflective of the past. Um, supply and price. Yes, there is some nuances. We've got some trade restrictions. We've got the choke, we've got the intervalley trade, the Murrumbidgee, the Goulburn. We also get some variations of allocations against the different entitlements. And this year is a really good example of that. Vic Murray, high reliability water share, only just clicked over to 100% allocation just not that long ago. To have 100%, hit 100% of high reliability water share this late in the season, it is actually reflective of a really a reasonably dry sort of situation. Whereas we had 100% allocation on the Murrumbidgee general security, which is more reflective of, you know, as good as it gets, so to speak. So there is some of those nuances and that, that can have some, um, we can see some uh, divergence from a couple of the, the main trading zones um, in, you know, in to, more so today than we have in the past. And, you know, that's part of what we have to uh, understand. So when we look at it, um, you know, the different entitlement uh, allocation prices in the different zones, so Red's the Murray's uh, zone, so below the choke, New South Wales, MIL and the Goulburn. Um, you see it generally, you know, it's, they do sort of track pretty closely together, but more recently we have actually been seeing some of this, this, this gap appearing. And, and more so in these dry periods when the resources, which it, which it basically was during that time, when the resources are more, there's more pressure on those resources. As things come off, they come together a bit more. And if we look at the market as we speak today, uh, most of the Murray system uh, water is sitting around about the $100, $100 mark. Um, whereas though there is still that differentiation in the MIL where, um, you know, it's about, you know, the, the 50 to $60, which is reflective of that, um, you know, that, that pretty healthy sort of allocations in, in, that, in that market and that, that the restrictions that are in place. We've seen entitlement price move um, over time. Um, and, you know, it, it does have some ups and downs. If we look at here, the purple being the Vic Zone 7 and um, the blue, the Golden Valley High Reliability Water Share. Um, uh, we do have some ups and downs. And then we, you know, we look at the MIL share and we see a bit of a, a drop off there. And effectively, what's going on there? Well, that entitlement over the last couple of years hasn't yielded too much and the market's just, you know, responding accordingly. So the market actually is, um, works things out. And uh, I'll just spend a little bit of time on this graph, Rob. Um, what we've got here is we're just looking at what is the, re, the, year, the dividend. And when I say what's the dividend on an entitlement, that's actually what would, be, what would we get from owning that entitlement if we sold it on the allocation market in that year. And our dividend is, is defined as being the, it's a rolling five year average of the weighted average uh, return on, on, on the allocation. So we look at we times the price times the percentage of the percentage of the allocations determine what the what the dividend is, and you can see and that's the dotted dotted line. You can see it's linked very closely to what the entitlement price is. So the entitlement price is just purely reflecting the yield the potential of that entitlement. Those blue dots, by the way, are just the average buyback price during those periods, but. Um, it's just driven from another bit of work we were doing. So, um, but when we look at the different in, um, entitlements across the across the basin, it's actually pretty consistent. Um, yes, there's, there's some variability in the price, but the yield or the average dividend return, that rolling five-year average, you know, around about the three to five percent, um, pretty consistent. Um, so the market pretty much sort of sorts it out um, in terms of um, the return and the value of that entitlement. And I'll talk a little bit about that, what that might mean in terms of should I own it or should I just live on the temporary market or the allocation market? We can't have a conversation here about water without touching on carryover. And, um, and when we look at carryover um, and the and the behaviour across across all of the basins, um, what I, what we've done here is just looked at the total of all the carryover across across the Southern Connected Basin, and just what change there is between the start of the year and the end and the end of the year. So 15, 16, um, a dryish year where we only have 23% um, allocation against MIL, but 100% on our highs. 
a little bit of a mining of the of the carryover, but you know, in effect, it's pretty much stayed stayed pretty constant. We move into a wet year, and as we would expect, uh, wet year, we can put it looks the build on that. We we come off the wet year, more of an average year, that 17, 18, we start to use some of that start, you know, that that carryover um, nest egg, so to speak. Um, another dry another dry year, we start to, to, to draw down again. But interestingly, the 1920 year, which was, you know, a pretty uh, a, a drought year in, in our terminology where we had less than 100% high reliability watershed, it actually increased. Um, so what's going on there? Now, I know there might be someone there putting their hand up because I can't see them saying, oh, well, but we had a really wet autumn and so... We had water that we were planning to use, but we didn't, and that's um, contributed to the carryover in that particular year. And I, my answer to that is, yes, that's right, but not to the scale of this amount of water. So what is happening here is, is, is some of the strategies that have been employed. Um, oh, man, what if 2021 is, an, is another significant dry year, and if I've got no choice on my water, my permanent, agriculture, uh, permanent horticulture, I might have to think about actually keeping some up, up my sleeve to, to manage that if it was to happen. And it does remind me of a comment from Bill Malcolm, who some of you may have heard about. Bill's a, um, um, a, an academic um, in Melbourne University, you know, and talking about human behaviour. And, uh, you know, when it's good, we think it's going to get better. When it's bad, we think it's going to go get worse. And generally what happens is the opposite of that. And there's a bit of that there, but it's a risk management ploy. The, the downside of not having water in that drought is significant for certain industries. And so they look to try and manage that risk as best they can. So yes, carryover is a tool, but it's used differently by, your, by the different groups. Horticulture, it's most definitely a, as a drought protection. And there is a bit of an, of an averaging of an allocation. And what I mean by that is bringing cheap water a cheap year into a dear year. So buying water when it's and carrying it over when it's cheap and, and accessing it when it's dear. But it's, it's, it is a drought protection mechanism. Dairy, maize, cotton, um, more about averaging that allocation, trying to spread that high and that low between years. Um, but there will be trigger points that they'll use. There will be a point where that, that sort of strategy, not I'll live on the market because it's a bit dear to carry over at, at prices. Um, that is suitable for them. Prices where they see, yep, yeah, I can maybe not quite make um, a profit from that. I might just play, play and take the risk. And rice generally use it um, often when, you know, there might be a late allocation or, or, or allocation announcements that was a bit late to get crops in, carry over for the next year and, um, and utilise it when, when generally water is pretty cheap. Now, there will be individuals in those different, different um, industries that will use it differently, but more broadly speaking, that's, that's how we see it, we'll carry over being used. Rory, I won't talk about this too much because I think one of your programs uh, later on is, is having a webinar more specifically at carryover, but just a few things to be wary of. Um, uh, you, know, you need to have access to entitlement, you either own it, lease it or, or park it. You need to understand the rules because they are different for different um, parcels of um, entitlement. It's not fail safe. You can be exposed to spills in Victoria. Probably not too much of a spill risk when you're carrying over against low reliability water share, but there is still a spill risk if it's against high. And in New South Wales, you forego next season's allocations if you meet your limits. But it can lock away some certainty on, on your water for next year. You know, it's a known amount that you're gonna have access to. But, you know, develop some trigger points. Think about and be disciplined with them because what I see with some, some situations is, um, yeah, oh, well, oh um, if I talked to people last year about when would they start buying water for carryover, they probably said, oh, whenever it dropped to below $200. Um, and then they ask the same question now, oh, I'm going to wait till it's below $100 um, because, you know, there's been that change that in that, in that base price. But think about your trigger points. Know what works for you. And, um, and be a bit disciplined because sometimes we can, um, oh, I'm going to wait for it to drop a bit more and sometimes we can miss the boat. Um, consecutive years of dry years will um, obviously increase that risk management option because to, to, to get water to carry over is going to be a dearer situation. But it's definitely part of the water management toolkit. 
And I'll just put a uh, just a question out there. Just how many people are out there doing it now? Well, um, I know I know quite a few that are, um, you know, and obviously because you know where we sit with our water price um, relative to recent times, is that um, you know it's something that uh, I wouldn't mind putting away for um, the dry day, so to speak. Um, so, assuming. If we assume no more water recovery, and you know we acknowledge there might be some, but effectively though, what we deal with going forward will be will be certainly linked to what we get from an inflow position, what that inflow position delivers in our allocation, and that's this is the variability we're going to have to manage. Manage. I can't take variability away. Um, you can't. You never can take variability away in agriculture. Um, but this is what we're dealing with. This is what we have to get our heads around to deal with. So just a little bit of a recap though, um, you know, managing our variability, this is our challenge. But, you know, first of all, what sort of user are you? Do you have no choice with water? You know, it's either water or, or not, or, or, you know, it's a, it's a complete dry off that can have significant implications to the business. So permanent uh, horticulture. Are you a reasonably consistent user, but it can flex a bit, you know, dairy, cotton, or are you more optimistic that, you know, the, the rice and cereals uh, turn off, turn on, depending on the price. Secondly, as I've sort of illustrated here, water price is driven by availability, the price curve, which is driven by climate. What rain we get in those years will deliver the allocations, which will deliver the supply, which will deliver the price. We've seen water price increase with water recovery, no doubt, no doubt. And over that period, we've also had a pretty dry, a dry period. So we've seen increases there. But with no more recovery or little recovery, um, the entitlement value and the allocation price, is, uh, and allocation price will be simply related whether it's wet or it's dry. Dry years will see firming, wet years will see softening. The question though, what sequence are we in? And what sequence are we going into? And if I could tell you that exactly, then I'd be picking the market exactly. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys. I'd be um, relaxing somewhere because I would be um, picking it right all the time and, um, and be, be feeling pretty happy about myself. But I can't. And therefore, I have to earn my, my dollars um, a different way. And that's about trying to help farmers work through this to help with their, their decisions. So, managing variability. Really, this, 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 there's only really three options. You can own it, uh, you can allocation trade, and we, I include leasing and full contracts as that's part of the mix of the allocation trade. And we can use carryover, and we've I've touched a bit on carryover already. So, I'm going to get this important concept of understanding in relation to owning or training water which um, you know, a lot will, will understand, um, but some may not think of it like this. In theory, from what we've de de described about before, owning or training is, can be the same because we have demonstrated the value is linked to the allocation price, not much difference. So, you know, what's, therefore do we just, yeah, what, we just do whatever we feel comfortable with. I'll just have a few more comments about that though. If you don't own water though, and you're trading on the allocation market, it's like a finance cost. You're using someone else's capital to gain access to water. So if you do not own water and you're an irrigation business, then you are running at a high financial risk. Is that good or bad? Well, um, it's it's not necessarily um, good or bad. It's just, you just need, that just needs to be a core understanding. You're using someone else's capital to support the business. And then there's a big but at the bottom of that screen. And what's the but about? Well, theory doesn't always play out in the real world. And uh, what we've seen in the real world, especially in the last 20 years, is that the owner of water has, has definitely been way, way in front. There's been a significant capital improvement on that water over the last 20 years. A combination of a reduction in the consumptive pool through the basin plant and a period of lower supply, lower allocations and lower water available. The other 
complication here too is that it comes in cycles, um, which means uh, allocation price and entitlement price also cycles. So um, timing is, is, is important. And, um, and if we bought here and sold here, then not such a great sort of outcome. If I bought here and sold here, thank you very much. Excellent sort of buying and selling strategies. Or if I buy here and be patient and sell here, another aspect of it. And I guess that's one other element of purchasing entitlement. Now, I, you, I, I reckon you need to think about it in the longer term. We don't buy tomorrow and sell some, um, buy yesterday and um, sell tomorrow. Um, it's more of a longer term outlook. So what, where, so when is it good timing? Well, um, again, if I knew, knew exactly what was going to happen in the third year in terms of how much water is going to come into those catchments and allocations or whatever, I'll get it right all the time. But we don't, and, um, and with hindsight, we do. So how much should you own? Well, it depends. Um, is buying water the best use of your next capital dollar? Um, there might be other investments on the on the farm that uh, will yield a, a better return at a point in time for your business. What's your attitude to risk? Are you comfortable going forward um, into the year with a um, uh, a big whack of water to be buy on the allocation market? Do you have alternatives to water with what you do in on your business? The other thing: Are you a wheeler or a dealer? This is not a derogative sort of uh, description. Some people are just good traders um, and actually uh, like the challenge of it. Um, others aren't and hate it. So these will all influence um, you know, what you do. But the last 20 years, most certainly you would have been better off owning um, with that large capital growth. The next 20 years, a um, few question marks. But I look at water, is it any different to owning or renting houses or owning or leasing land? I think, is water any different? I don't think so. Um, and generally owners have done pretty well. And But the reality is, just like renting a house, when I first left uni, buying a house was just not an option. I didn't have the capital. I had to rent. I had to live in that environment until I could, could get in a position to buy. Um, and so access to capital is sometimes limited. So what should I do? Should I um, sell, own, lease, carry over? Well, certainly the strategies that will be employed, as I've said, will be different. Um, to horticulture will be different to dairy, which will be different to rice. And within commodities too, there will be differences on what people do. So dairy farmer A versus dairy farmer B, they will be, they'll have different farming systems. We didn't really used to have different farming systems. We're all the same, but now we're all quite different. You know, how well you use it? What level of exposure have you got already? What's your balance sheet like? What's the attitude to risk? What's your view of the future, short term and long term? All those will influence where you set yourself up from, um, you know, water procurement position, ownership, etc. But when we get down to the, you know, we've, we've, okay, we've got what we've got and we're thinking about and forward planning about the, you know, the more tactical operational decisions, you know, we need to get informed, you know, what's, and planning for next year starts now, or if not earlier than now. Now, what's my autumn plan and what might I have left come the 30th of June? What are prices like now? Pretty good, I reckon. Do I consider it a good buy and load up carryover, um, put some certainty into next year? Well, in a year like this, it's probably not such a such a thought through process because of where prices are. Other years, it can be a little bit more, mm, do I or don't I? Work it through, think it through for you. Can I afford to do it or can I afford not to do it? Some trigger, trigger points, I've mentioned that before, is useful for aid to decision making. Making and thinking through, so when, th when you aren't under the pump about some good, good pricing decisions can be useful when you actually have to make quick calls. When, when you might turn the dial up and buy hard or when you might need to actually slow down because it's gone the, the opposite to where you're thinking it, or the higher price. You know, your trigger points, you know, will be different too, um, you know, and part of that is knowing what you, what, knowing what you can make from a megalitre of water that you use. 
outlooks. Outlooks are part of the information. The outlooks that the water authorities provide are informative. Um, people, uh, some might think different to that, but my experience when I look at it is the, the outlooks are based on scenarios of inflows. And if those inflow scenarios come, come to be what actually happens, where they say those allocations will end up are pretty damn close. Our challenge though is, well, which one of those inflow scenarios will we enter into? And again, we can't put the rubber stamp and guarantee what that is, but we can be watching, we can be looking at weather forecasts, the, what the climate models are saying. Yes, they're not perfect. They're getting better. We're getting more information about that. But remember, we also not only have to think about our own backyard, but what's going on in the rest of that Southern Connected Basin. Where are we situated right now with this, you know, how are the storage is looking? Um, yes, all the water in storages doesn't mean it's all ready for allocation because some of it's tied up with, you know, river losses and um, carryover and things like that. But it still gives it you know, still builds our story that to get a sense of where we what we we're entering into. And then from an inflow position, I like to I like to go, well, what is it doing today? And there is information out of it, out there available to get that. This graph here is um comes from the Murray Darling Basin Weekly Report. It's about the last page of that report. I sometimes read some of that report, but most of the times I just flick to the last page. And I can see where are the inflows tracking and how does that compare to where I thought they were going to be tracking and where the outlooks are saying, well, if we get a, you know, above average allocations, we're going to be at X percent of an allocation. I can build that allocation amount across the Southern Con Connected Basin and how much water is likely to be out there. And I can get a, a, a bit of a sense of what I'm going to be dealing with. But remember, as we all, as we all should know, that the money months are here. July through to November, that's that's where we make or break. And that's where I'm, I'm probably looking at the, um, these graphs on a weekly basis rather than maybe once and now, now and then when, you know, at this time of year. So, you know, what are we, what are your buying strategies? What can you do? You know, you've developed a sense of the water price. You've looked at, you've got a bit of a plan, but not too many people that I work with, um, uh, will have um, a situation where they are fully sorted with the, with their entitlement ownership to give them the water that they need. So we most will be looking and needing to purchase on the allocation market. But the ups and downs of that allocation market is, is a hard one. You know, it's a really hard one to predict. You know, when, are we, when should we buy? When will we know when it's the bottoming out in any particular year? Some years we start high and end up low. Some years we start high, uh, start low and end up high. And we have a few little bumps along the way. And um, this just driven straight off the uh, you know, Victorian Water Register is, 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 is that, that roller coaster of the temporary water um, you know, over the last couple of years. So this line here being um, 1920 and uh, sorry, um, yeah, 1920 and this one being 1819. Yep, this uh, last year started high and then really dropped away. The year before started low, well, it wasn't really low, $250 was pretty high really, but it nearly doubled by the end of the year. And, you know, we do, did we know we were sitting here that it was going to do this? Pretty hard to gauge on that. Um, yes, we had a really good sort of, you know, end of season situation that really started, you know, the, did we turn, turn from a sequence of dry to wet? We had the forecast talking about La Nina, all that sort of stuff. And we started to see some evidence. We had probably the best autumn that I've experienced in this part of the world at that point in time. So picking the high point, low point is a, is a bit of a guessing game. So sometimes people look at strategies, well, I'll just, I'll guarantee my average. If I need a thousand megs, I might buy 10% every month, hundred megs a month for 10 months. I'm guaranteed an average result or I could trade it. I, I could spot buy it and or spot buy it. Um, and you could do better by doing that, or you could do worse. So again, though, know your price trigger points, your cap and collars, a price when you, you know, you think, yep, that's getting to a point where I think it's worthwhile putting a bit more away than I would may, may normally. And then obviously when it goes the other way, what do we do? We might change what we plan 
um, because of that. Dry off some less productive areas or, or look for alternatives. Yes, there's other options out there. Um, leasing, for example, um, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tool that's available. Um, you know, it still retains an allocation risk, but does ex reduce your exposure to the allocation market. But it's really just really a, a strategy to smooth some of the highs and lows. It's a form of averaging. Um, and, you know, some look at trying to have a, a series of leases that roll over at different times. So, you know, they might, if they walk, their portfolio is 400 megs, they might have 100 megs rolling over every year, coming up for renewal every year. Um, to spread that timing risk, because if all our lease arrangements come come uh, uh, or end at, um, uh, in the middle of a pretty dry period, then re-engaging in those lease options might be um, a, a more expensive option. Those things don't get set up overnight. It's a build-up, but it you know, can form part of your strategy and, and is part of a you know, strategy that some, some apply. For contracts, another source of options that people can have. It, it absolutely provides a, a certainty and known volume, known cost, but with certainty comes cost. And so some will see it as, as useful and suitable for a portion of what they need. Um, and others won't, won't use those, um, those uh, a, a tools such as that because, because you know, the cost and returns beyond what they feel they can benefit from. So the mix that you have, um, is all about um, is is your call. There's no recipe. You just need to weigh it through and work it through for your own circumstances. Assess the pros and cons. Um, you know, a low risk, high capital is striving striving to own all your needs, but we all won't be in a position to be able to do that. A high risk, low capital, you know, live on the allocation market. Sometimes that can work though. Just yeah, obviously needs a bit a lot more proactive management and capacity to handle um, those, those high years, strategies to handle those really high years. But underlying everything is, and I know this might be a bit of a red rag to the bull for, um, for farmers out there, but you know, needing to get more from less because they've always been telling me I need to get more for less, but I see it every day. I see people getting more from less every day. It's part of what we've done you know, for the last hundred years and I see it as something we'll do for the next hundred years. Yes, sure, we've had some, stronger pressure on that improvement requirement with with um, with the sort of the the, the Murray Darling Basin plan but effectively we we will always need to to improve our productivity and the other thing there is having non-water users as owners of water I, you know I hear it you know these water barons and they're controlling the market and and all those sort of things but at the end of the day it's those owners actually are providing some of the choices for our strategies above if we all, if, if all um, water was owned by users, then you know, the allocation market wouldn't be too active. The leasing market wouldn't be too active. Four contracts wouldn't be too active. So it is providing us a mix. Um, they won't own everything, they never will. Um, but they're, 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 they're out there. And you know, I know quite a number of you know, farmers who you, who you see um, when you know, retiring, you, retaining some of their water portfolio, part of their super plan. And then, you know, they're in the game of providing some options for, for irrigators who may not have the capital to, to, to get to ownership at, at a point in time. So just winding up, Robbie, um, supply, take home messages, supply is the key driver, and you've got to consider the whole of connected basin. Future prices, inflow is the key, we'll have highs, lows, and everything in between. Water will be available for industries and it will be price related. Um, and the last five years, we think is a really good indicator of what we have to deal with. You need to keep informed because things are always changing. I see you've got the talk about the Intervalley Trade, you know, the next seminar. Um, absolutely, we've got to keep abreast of the change because it's happening. There's no recipes, and but you do need to manage your risk. It takes time, it takes some thinking, but get a plan together and act. And, you know, if it is difficult and find it a bit too, you know, can be overwhelming at times, you know, get some help. Talk to people who, um, who are working with others about it, people like myself, people like um, people who've got some good relationships with their brokers and all sorts of things. But seek help get, get, um, to help you work your way through it. And, at this, and as I said before, we always have to be looking how we can get more from less. So 
I've taken a breath now, Bobby, uh, Rob, sorry. Um, uh, and look, obviously the, the, uh, the, the presentation and the, um, the recording of this available, you people can dig deep, deep into it, but sort of available there for some questions. Thanks, Daryl. Um, you've done pretty well for, for time there and you've uh, given us quite a bit to think about, outlined some pretty good management strategies. And, and what I heard was that those management strategies will depend um, on the farm business itself um, and also on the, the personal style of the, of the manager and also outlined um, some information there about the importance um, of just monitoring and, and keeping a, a finger on the pulse, um, particularly in terms of the drivers of upcoming water availability and and the water market. So uh, yeah, thanks. That was was um, very informative. I've um, just got a couple of uh, specific questions, and they came in earlier in the in the presentation one from andrew martin that refers back to i think it was slide 18 daryl um the one of the southern murray darling basin volume um versus price um and so the question is on on that chart wouldn't most of the demand increase be below the choke, which would show up on the MIL price data curve? Um, so I guess what, the point I would make on that would be that, um, yes, there's been some changes in, in, the, in demand and there's been some changes in commodity prices and the dairy industry's had a pretty, uh, a couple of rough periods during this 25 cycle which my price graph is um it's 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 been um but what we see is it's still a very supply driven across the southern connected basin situation now there has been as we've seen a little bit of uh, divergence on that um on those price on that price position below the choke because of the some of the restrictions in in play in those dry periods and we have seen that and that might be more of an issue going going forward in in the dry periods in in that below the choke sort of pressures, but when we see water availability come back come back to more um, not so much under pressure, we see those prices coming back together. Yep, thanks, Daryl, and I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Another question from Kerry Greenwood, and that relates, I think, to the. Um, to that same price graph. And the question is, are the years on the price graph at the end of the, the water year? So, yeah, so sorry, I might not have explained that uh, correctly. That's the weighted, those price points are the weighted average price for the allocation in that year. So it's looking at the weighted average price over the whole year, not just a spot price at the end of the year on that price graph. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Daryl. That's that's all the questions I've got from participants. I'm not sure if if you or John have any questions in your your chat box. Uh, no, I, I can't see anything in my chat box. I don't know if. Uh... Yeah, I only I got one about uh, access to the recording. Uh, hopefully, we'll get the recording posted online next week sometime and we'll send an email uh, with the link to that recording to everyone who's registered. And and Robbie, um, just I guess a, 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 um, just a, a final point for me is, um, and it's, it's related to that um, should I own or should I trade sort of query that often I, I get faced with often. Um, and it's and it's probably more of a just my bias it will come in here um, is that you know i often ask an irrigator the question well how important is the water resource to your business and nine times out of ten they'll say it's critical and if the answer to me if the answer comes back is the water resource is critical then i tend to say well i would have a bit of a stake in that in that resource how much of a stake? Well, and then you get into some nitty gritties. 
But um, you know, the ownership stake is part of it. Now, I know that there are businesses out there that operate, you know, with very low water um, water um, entitlement ownership. Um, but it is, it's just, you know, it's just, it's a lot more of a proactive requirement there. And, um, you know, a lot of effort and thought has to go into the plan in under those circumstances. But I reckon um, if I'm an irrigator, I'd have a stake in that, in that resource. Okay. Yep. Um, thanks, Daryl. And thanks for a, uh, a great presentation. Um, I'll just remind people that the poll is up on the screen and it would be greatly appreciated if, if you took um, the short amount of time required to to complete that. But um, yeah, just a reminder that there will be another webinar in late March and uh, registrants will be notified um, about that webinar closer to the date. Um, thanks to, to Daryl again for a uh, very informative um, presentation. Um, thanks to John for making sure that the, uh, the, the, the webinar ran uh, smoothly, I think. Um, and thanks to uh, for everyone for participating and uh, contributing to the, uh, to the webinar. Thank you and uh, have a good good afternoon. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I've got a couple more questions have come through. Okay. Uh, one comment from Kevin. He said, I believe you may have underweighted the maturing almond plantings. Um, not sure if you want to respond to that or not, Daryl. And I've got another one afterwards as well. Yeah, no, look, we know that there's, um, there's um, almonds um, that you know, are young and still working forward to their maturity. Um, um, but effectively, we think what's in the ground now and what's going to be maturing is about where they're going to be. And um, at the end of it, any more growth will potentially come from retirement or some of it. Thanks, Daryl. And thanks, Kevin. Another question from Cathy. How confident are you that the demand from horticulture has stabilised? So basically along the same lines, yeah. Yeah, and look, you know, um, we're talking future and predicting things is always fraught with danger, but it comes down to that fundamental uh, point that we made, that was made earlier. Um, you know, drought will, will limit, will have an element of a cap on that horticulture. Now, will they, will they develop beyond what water available is, is in, a, in, in a drought? Well, they, they may, um, but when the drought comes, there might be some, um, some pain to be borne because of, um, of a position of not actually being able to get the water um, in those circumstances. There might be, uh, you know, some might employ some pretty significant carryover strategies to grow a little bit, but I think, um, I think that's more around the edges or the margins and that, um, you know, we are getting, you know, close to where, where it might be. There might be a bit more activity in the, in the Bidgee um, in, terms of, in terms of what can happen there, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty confident about that, that that main cap, that main capper is the restriction that the next you know, drought provides. If we ever run a really wet years and, um, and our memories fade, you know, there might be a, a, another element of growth there um, but it may be um, a bit of false confidence. Well, that's all. I think that, that's certainly the, all the questions from me. Um, I, I, no more questions, John? No, I haven't got any more. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, one's just come through. I'll, I'll just before you do that, John, I'll, I'll just remind people it is um, it is four minutes past two by my clock. So, you know, if if people want to leave, um, feel free. But if you want to stick around for, for further questions, feel free to uh, to do that too. Yeah, this one's come through from Neil. He's asked, what about the Lodden system? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, we've 
we've um, been talking predominantly about that Southern Connected um, Basin and um, and and the Loddens Loddens part of it. Um, but uh, and you know there will be some linkages again to the the, the the full picture. But there is some more nuances around around that. But um, uh, I think as a as a as a general rule, we are all sort of um, in the same pot. This is the joy of um, the webinars. You can't get that sense of uh, how that's gone down with an answer. But anyway, that's what we have to live with in this in this format. Any any other questions, Robbie? No, no more questions, Daryl. Um, so I, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll wind it up there. Um, so yeah. Top work and and um, thanks again to to everyone.